Good morning, Dr. Fauci. Welcome back. We have many questions as usual, so I'm starting with the first one. And I would like to know about the latest and new mutation of the COVID virus, the so-called Delta Plus. How dangerous is it in your opinion? Well, we better be careful because people are using the wrong terminology. There is another Delta that's not Delta Plus. It's an AY 4.2. And it is a variant that we're starting to see become a little bit more dominant in the UK. So it occupies about 10 or 15 percent over the standard Delta, and it increases slowly. I just began a, a little bit earlier today speaking with my counterparts in England, and they are saying that although this variant is starting to creep up a bit in prevalence, it does not appear to be more dangerous at all compared to the standard Delta. So although it is increasing in its frequency, it does not appear to make people more seriously ill. In the United States, we have virtually no uh, AY 4.2 variant. It's still 99.9% .9 of the standard Delta variant. So I, I think it's something we want to keep our eye out on we want to continue to follow it, but thus far, thus far, it does not seem to be something of great concern. So let's talk in about the perception of public opinion. A great deal of fear anyway is arising worldwide. Do you expect uh, a new wave of the virus all over the world? You know, that's going to really depend very heavily on the success that we have in getting people vaccinated, not only vaccinated with the original regimen, but also we are starting to see that the immunity is waning. We started to see it in Israel, then in the UK, now in the United States and Brazil and South Africa, where people who've been vaccinated six months or more ago with the mRNA and uh, two months or more ago with the J&J, &J, very likely should get boosted. So we're giving a third shot boost of the mRNA and a second shot boost of the J&J &J to everyone older than 18 years old, 18 years of age or older. The, the unfortunate situation is that worldwide, globally, we find that there's a very low percentage in the lower and middle income countries of the people, the proportion of people who are getting vaccinated. And that's the reason why the United States, as well as other developed nations, should take very seriously our responsibility to make sure that we get doses a vaccine to the lower and middle income countries, because otherwise this virus will continue to circulate throughout the world and it would be very difficult to get good control over it. So vaccination is the answer. So let's talk about, as you said, about uh, the booster dose. Uh, what does evidence say about safety and effectiveness? of booster shots. Yeah, we have a lot of data on that right now since we began a booster program and we've now uh, boosted about 33 million people in this country. Clearly the booster is clearly safe. It has the same safety profile as the second dose of an mRNA vaccine. But importantly, it's extremely effective. In fact, if you look at the data from Israel, it diminishes the likelihood of getting infected, of getting hospitalized by multifold. So it enhances the immunity against infection by tenfold and against severe disease by up to 20 fold. So it is a very, very effective way 
to optimize your degree of protection. And that is by getting the booster shot. So it's both safe and it's highly effective. So in your opinion and in accordance with scientific data, uh, we should get the third dose after five, six or nine months after the second dose. Yeah, it, it really is empiric in many respects. In the United States, the recommendation is anywhere from six months or more from the original regimen for the mRNA and anywhere from two months or more for the J&J. &J. In other countries, for example, in Israel, they say anywhere from five months or more. So I think there's not that much difference, five or six or more months. You don't want to get too excited about that. Okay. Anyway, uh, in your opinion, we will need a new shot every year. We don't know that as a fact. What I am hoping is that the third dose of the mRNA will, in, will imprint upon us a degree of durability of protection that's much longer than just the two doses. But we're not going to know that until we boost people and we follow them for several months. It may be that you do not need to get reboosted for a year or two or more. That's possible. It's also possible that after six or eight months or nine months, we may need to boost again. We do not know the answer now. But we will find out that answer when we follow people for a considerable period of time. Another popular issue is regarding our children. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine is now available for children ages from 5 to 11. And so uh, what's your suggestion? We should vaccinate all our sons and daughters? And daughters. <laughs> Don't forget the daughters. No, never. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the answer is, in the United States, we did a clinical trial in children from 5 to 11 years old with the Pfizer lower dose. Instead of the 30 micrograms, it is 10 micrograms. So it's one-third the dose. We have found it to be very safe. There have been no adverse event signals of any concern. And we have found that it is 91% effective in preventing clinically apparent disease. So because of that, our regulatory and recommendation agencies are recommending vaccinating all children from five to 11 years old with the Pfizer BioNTech. Anyway, unfortunately, many people, both in the US and in Europe, still say no to the vaccine. Uh, in your opinion, should the vaccine be mandatory at this point of the pandemic? Well, that's a very charged uh, uh, issue. In the United States and throughout Europe, we look and see on TV what's going on in the Netherlands and in other countries. However, it is important to point out that even though we do not like to mandate that people do things that they may not want to do themselves, we've got to balance that against what happens if people don't get vaccinated. And so because of that, we have encouraged local mandates for businesses, for universities, and we've also mandated that businesses that have 100 or more employees either require vaccination or require regular testing. In addition, if you work for the United States federal government, you have to be vaccinated if you want to keep your job. We would prefer that people would get vaccinated without requiring it, but that doesn't seem to be the case. 
And so if you don't get a substantial proportion of people vaccinated, that endangers not only the unvaccinated people, but because it increases the dynamics of infection in the community, it also poses a danger to the vaccinated people because no vaccine is 100% effective. And when you have a lot of virus circulating, even the vaccinated people are at danger, much less so than the unvaccinated people, but you are still putting them at risk. We know anyway that there's a percentage of people who cannot be treated with the vaccine. So in your opinion, the monoclonal antibodies can, can be the solution? The answer is we are doing clinical studies now and one particular study showed that if you in fact give anybody to an uninfected person who has been exposed to an individual who was infected, that is called post-exposure prophylaxis. But if you continue the monoclonal antibody treatment for months after, in fact, you can prevent infection of people who may not have a good response to the vaccine. So there are studies now that are trying to definitively show that. And I think it will be sometime in the future, a very good way to prevent infection for those who do not make a good response to a vaccine. But let us not forget that the best way to induce prevention is with a vaccine. Okay. And anyway, I would like to ask you about the since there's a great deal of news and also excitement about them. Uh, there are two new antiretroviral pills that could be available very soon, maybe also in the next few days or weeks. Do you think that they represent the best possible therapy now available? Well, yes. If you look at the data for malnupiravir, which is the Merck drug, that decreases the likelihood of requiring hospitalization or dying by about 50% if given early in the course of infection within the first three to five days. The Pfizer drug, which is called Paxlovid, that is in many respects even better in that it diminishes the likelihood of hospitalization or death by about 89% if given in the first three days of clinically recognizable infection. So although they have not yet been given emergency use authorization, we're hoping that within a reasonable period of time, it will be available for people who are infected. Dr. Fauci, I have a very last question for you. Uh, many people are quite shocked about the effects of the so-called long COVID. Uh, people who recovered from the disease, in your opinion, should change some of their daily habits or have some special precautions about their health? Well, I'm not so sure that they need to change anything, but we do know that after you recover from the acute phase of COVID-19, anywhere from 10 to, in some studies, up to 50% of people have the persistence of symptoms that go on for weeks or months. We are doing a very large study on those individuals. And in fact, we still don't know what the underlying pathogenic mechanisms of that are and that's the reason why we're doing a very, very large cohort study to determine the cause of that and what is that we can do to mitigate it and improve the symptoms of these people. But it definitely is a problem when people recover from the acute phase. Thank you, Dr. Fauci, and I hope that we'll talk again very soon. Thank you again. Nice to be with you. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.